Yeah, what's going on, Discovery Church? Ow! Some people uh, don't know what just happened. Um, and that's okay. This is just my friends. These are my friends. <laughs> Everybody's like, I understand why they're so excited. We don't know this person. <laughs> what's going on? I'm Matt. I'm the lead pastor of Discovery Church in Camarillo. And, uh, yeah, man, we did, we did pastor swap today. Pastor Jason's over there, man, just bringing it. Right now, what are we at? Yeah, right now they're crying, and service hadn't even started yet. That's how good he's doing right now. So don't let me down. No, man, I'm, I'm so excited uh, to be here. I realize, you know, that some things have changed since last I lived in Bakersfield. Um, something that you guys need to understand, this is like a homecoming for me. This is me coming home, getting an opportunity, man, to share with, with mi gente, with my people, man. This is, this is what we're here, that's what I'm here for, man. Just loving on my people this morning, and uh, I'm so stoked about it. But can I tell you that some things about my, about my life have changed a little bit? Like, for example, I'm bougie now. I'm bougie now, so like... Um, I'm just going to be real with you. I lived in this w w climate for a while. And it's so easy to get reacclimated to nicer weather. I'm just going to be real with you. <laughs> it's so easy. I, I got out of the car uh, today, which quit, by the way. The car was just like, no, I will not start again. I'm done. <laughs> and that is the truth. <laughs> just in case you think I'm lying, that happened. That's for real. And, like, uh, these were skinny jeans when I got out, but just the, hot, the heat just caused them to expand a little bit. I also lost about six pounds in water weight. At six in the morning is when this all happened, which is crazy. But, yeah, y'all, I'm, I'm bougie now. I, got, I was like, it's so hot. Oh, it's so hot. You know, so now I'm one of those people, which is just terrible. Uh, I'm, I'm so excited to be home. I'm so excited to be here sharing uh, the finale of at the movies have you guys liked this series i've loved this series man we're doing this in camarillo as well i know espanol's doing it i'm so, this series is just so good and the reason i think it's so good is because like when we were talking about this this sermon series and we're building it out we were like you know what, man jesus jesus taught by telling stories like that was his main way of teaching he's like he's, let me tell you a story right He's in a farming community. He's like, let me talk to you a little bit about the vine. You know why? Because the farmers get it. They were like, okay, cool, the vine. We understand vines. That's cool. Let me tell you a little bit about the seed, right? And he, and he, tell, he, he taught in parables. He taught in stories. To today's climate. Because today's society, we don't have no more nanas. We don't have no more nanas that tell stories anymore. Y'all have a nana that tell, I got my nana that tell stories, right? My, nanas, nanas tell good stories, man. They tell the kind of stories, you don't need no snacks. You don't need popcorn. You don't need candy. You don't need a soda. You don't need to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the movie. You don't need none of that. Because Nana tell you a story that's so good, it'll compel you to just stay. <laughs> tell me about when we're, there were no cell phones, Nana. <laughs> tell me about that one time where you had to dial like this, Nana. When you messed up, it was the worst thing in the world. What are you doing? I'm waiting because you, you can't just pick up and go. It'll remember. It'll remember what you just dialed. But we don't have a lot of that in our culture today. We don't, we don't usually get around a fire and tell stories. What do we do? We go to the movies because we enjoy a good story. We just want it told in the way that we like it. We want it in a rom-com fashion. We would like to go, aw, and laugh a little bit. Preferably, it could be done in about an hour and a half. And we would like some snacks. If there is not air conditioning, we will not go to that movie. That's how we prefer our stories today. And so uh, I thought, man, let's, let's do this, man. And so I'm, I'm so all in with the At The Movie series. And I'm so stoked to be sharing about Wonder Woman. How many have seen this movie? Come on. Yes. Okay. Wow. How many have not seen this movie? Raise your hand if you haven't seen Wonder Woman. What are you doing with your life? What are you doing? <laughs> Go watch Wonder Woman. I'm not a rich man. I might no, I'm not gonna say I'll pay for you. I'm not gonna pay for you. <laughs> Go on a Tuesday. 
Go on it to go watch this movie. I'm telling you straight up. This movie, like, if you're into like that kind of movie, this genre, everybody kind of has this scale where like the Dark Knight is like the movie which all superhero movies are judged by. Like nothing will ever beat Heath Ledger as the Joker, right? You're like, oh no, he's just he was so good and he won an Oscar and he was just wonderful. And okay, that's cool. I'm telling you straight up, Wonder Woman's right there. I'm being real with you. Wonder Woman's that good, you guys. Go see Wonder Woman. It is, it is amazing. You guys need to see it. And the whole premise of this movie is about this person that is endowed with these gifts, these abilities, and she is compelled to go. She's got a mission. She's got stuff to do. And so today, I want to talk to you a little bit about your call. And you will notice, by the way that I'm pacing back and forth, two things. Number one, I am a different speaker than Pastor Jason. <laughs> That'll be the first thing you notice. Because he's really, really good at teaching in one spot. I'm not. I must move or I will die. <laughs> number two. I forgot what number two was, guys. I'm just kidding. We're going to unlock your call today. We're going to unlock it. We're going we're gonna to find out what keeps you from the call. Because we have a tendency as human beings to build barriers. Even e A lot of the stuff that keeps you from your call, it's not a God thing. It's not a God barrier. God barriers don't keep you from your call. Right? It's something you put there. So it's, it's barriers in our lives that keep us from our call. Let, let's go to Matthew real quick. Matthew chapter 5 says this. It says, you're the, you're the salt of the earth. He's telling a story again. You're the salt of the earth. What good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You're the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Do you know why they didn't do that back then, Tony? Because it would start a fire. Because it's stupid. That's why. You said stupid from the pulpit? Yeah, I did. Why? Because sometimes people are stupid. Sometimes we're, listen, hey, I love you. Sometimes you do stupid stuff. Sometimes you guys are stupid. Sometimes I do stupid stuff. Sometimes I'm stupid. It, it happens. We don't light a lamp to put it under a basket. Instead, it's placed on a stand where it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, now we're tying in the story. I just told you a little bit of the story. Now let me tell you how that applies to your life, right? This is, this is the way Jesus taught. The same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. The basket in that parable is the story of the barrier. The basket is the barrier in that parable. And the barriers in your life are not there, again, because God put them there. They're there because he lit a light in you and you put a basket over it. For whatever reason that may be. And we're going to look at some different reasons. Let's actually, let's get into it. Let's look at some. In my opinion, the barriers that keep you from doing what God has called you to do 100% have to do with your point of view. 100%. So the first barrier I want to talk about is this. You have a wrong view of yourself. You have a wrong view of self. That's the first barrier that you deal with. Wrong view of self, whatever that might look like in your life. Maybe it's doubt. Maybe you tried something before and you got burned or it didn't work out. So now you doubt. Right? Maybe it's fear. Maybe God's asking you to, you know, step out in faith and do something crazy. And you're like, nope, not going to do that. You didn't give me wings. Not going to fly. Maybe it's pride. And this, this one, man, I was, I was talking to uh, the worship team. The worship team's so amazing, you guys. They are. They're so amazing, and I uh, shout out to them because, like, three days ago, <laughs> I sent them a text, and I was like, hey, could you guys do all the porn power lifts? Because it really goes good with what we're talking about. And you know what? They were like, Psh, on it, done. They kill that song. I love that song so much. And Drew starts hollering at us for no reason at the end of it, and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yell at me. You know, I love it. But I was talking to him before the first service, and I said, you know what, guys? 
you guys are faithful in your, in your giftings and in your talents, and you serve men, and you are doing something for God every single week, sometimes every single day, what it takes to do what they're doing. Every single day, man, they're faithful in serving, but there is another plane that God wants you to step on. There's another rung to this ladder. There's another step. There's a next step. Even if you're serving, there's a next step for you. But sometimes you will allow barriers to stop you. Pride is a huge barrier in the church. Now I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about church people. So all of you people that claim to know Jesus, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about us. Okay, why is that? Because we get so focused on our giftings and abilities and what we can do that as we are doing them unto the Lord, we're accepting all of the praise for it. We're accepting all the credit for it. Really, we're doing it because we're good at it. But God's inviting you to go another level. God's inviting you to a next step. The next step in your service is serving from a place where God gets all of the glory. So we want to break down this barrier of pride we want to break down the barrier of insecurity man wrong view of self maybe it's because you're insecure i'm not built that way maybe that, that's just i don't know i mm-hmm. maybe that's you first peter says it like this and peter said lots of stuff you guys peter said <laughs> he was he was just crazy look what he said he said you're a chosen generation a royal priesthood a holy nation his own people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light And we take that and we twist it, right? We take that and we twist it and we go, you you, you got it backwards, man. I'm a royal priesthood. You don't even know. You can't tell me what to do. We we act like that toward our bosses, you know. You can't tell me what to do. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a, don't you know I'm chosen? (laughs) Don't you know he pays you? You better do what your boss says. (laughs) Well, God, get me another job. Okay, God really would like for you to do good at the job you're at, but okay. We allow these barriers, man. Wrong view of self. You know what else? Wrong view of others will keep you from doing what God has called you to do. You get a wrong view of others. If you're like me, sometimes people upset you. Oh, nobody else? Okay, that's cool. That's cool. It's not lonely out here. There's a lot of us. You're just not being honest. People make me mad. People make me mad sometimes. Ugh. And that wrong view of others, when I get in that space, you know what it does? It puts me in a place where I feel like they don't deserve to hear what I have to say. They don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. You got people in your, you got enemies in your life that you won't share Jesus with. You won't be Jesus with them. Why? They don't deserve it. They don't deserve me being nice to them. They don't deserve me being Jesus to them. Now, I'll be Jesus to everybody else, but I'm not going to be Jesus with them. Mm -mm. Do you know her? You must not work with her. They don't deserve it. You know, another wrong view of others is, is they won't listen. Anybody ever feel like that? Man, coming from my background, I feel like that all the time, you guys. I was not raised in church. And so I'm expected now. You guys, we are so blessed in Camarillo to have the team that we have, and I would venture to say that literally 98% of our team has, has just has known God. A lot of them have been just raised in church. And God has asked me, somebody that didn't even believe that God existed 17 years ago, to lead these people. And you know what I do sometimes? Sometimes when I have the wrong view of others, I go, they're not going to listen. They won't listen. I say no for them. Some of the best advice that I was ever given in my life was never say no for somebody. Never say no for somebody. I was 18 years old and an atheist and a smart one. I was one of those, you know, people that was a smug atheist. I would would tell you why and how and do math and stuff in front of you and show you why God didn't exist and all this stuff, right? And the truth of the matter is, is really I had taken some things in my life very personal. I've been through things that you guys couldn't even imagine. And that's just the truth. And I could not believe that there was a God in heaven that was good, that loved me, that had something for me to do, that had a call on my life, and he would allow all of this trash to happen. There's no way. 
you could convince me that God existed. And then I had this little annoying friend. <sighs> she would get on my nerves. Because every time I saw her, she would invite me to church. And when I say every time I saw her, listen, I know I'm an atheist at this point in my life. I know you only have church twice a week. You have church on Sunday, and you have some kind of midweek something that you do. Okay, that's cool. You guys do your thing, right? I'm going to go have a life, is how I would say it. You know, I was mean. She would ask me every single day, hey, Matt, why don't you come to church with me? No. Hey, Matt, why don't you come to church with me? No. I took pleasure in saying no. Matt, come on, man, come to church with me. Not going to do it. Not going to happen. I must have said no a million times. And then she asked one more time. And I said, look, if I go, will you promise to, for the rest of your life, put the shut to the up and stop inviting me to church? True story. She said, I promise. If you come with me one time, I'll leave you alone. I will never ask you to come to church ever again. I said, sold. I will go with you one time, and then you're going to leave me alone. She's out of my life. I want, it, I want you out. Okay. And I went. <laughs> Can I tell you why people are clapping right now? Because it doesn't matter what your viewpoint is. God's got a call on your life. Never say no for somebody. When you have a wrong view of others and you say, man, they'll never listen, they'll never listen. I've asked them a million times, but what if you asked them one more time and they said yes? You never know who you're inviting to church. You never know. And it's not your job to save them. It's your job to invite them. It's your job to say, come on, let's go. No. Come on, let's go. No. However you got to get them here, man. You, lo you love them into church. You keep on inviting people because a wrong view of self is a barrier to your call. When you say no to people, that's a barrier. Look at, look at this in, in Acts. Peter, again, always got something to say. My man Peter always got something to say. He began to speak. Now, at this point in time, Peter's at this house of this dude named Cornelius. And at this point, Peter is feeling like he knows Jesus pretty well. Jesus has ascended into heaven. Peter is going about doing the work of the Lord. And there's a T on that sometimes, only when you mean it. And so Peter has decided that he knows exactly who Jesus is for. Jesus is for the people that have a promise from God. Jesus is for the Jews. That's it. Jesus is not for anybody else. Peter's, Peter has made this decision. He knows it. In his heart of hearts, this is who Jesus is for. Not for anybody else. Peter has this dream twice. God's trying to tell him something. So Peter goes to this house, this dude named Cornelius. He finds out when he shows up the house that the Holy Spirit has invaded the space of these people that are not Jewish. These people, and really all it meant at that time is these people that didn't have a promise from God. He thought, well, these, these people don't have a promise from God. We have a promise from God. So Jesus is only for the people that have a promise from God. And he shows up at Cornelius' house and the Holy Spirit is there. And he's like, huh. And he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but he accepts from every nation the one who fears him and the one that does right. Peter had a wrong view of others, and it would have kept him from his call to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ had he stayed believing what he believed and not allowed God to show him that and change him in that moment. Wrong view of others is a huge barrier. The last barrier is this, a wrong view of God. Maybe the barrier in your life is that you have a wrong view of God. Well, he can do it all by himself. He's God. You're the God of the impossible. He's God. He can do it all by himself. Can he? Sure. He's God. Will he? No. That's what you're for. That's what you're for. God used it. You know what? Okay, hold on. 
part of this wrong view of God isn't that you feel like he can do it all by himself, but you feel like he can't use you. I'm too broken. He can't use me. He can't use me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've been through in my life. You don't know. Oh, my goodness. No. You don't know. He can't use me. But God is looking for people just like you. God specializes in using broken people. You know why? Because when God uses broken people, he gets all the credit. You know why God took an atheist that did not believe God existed, that people heard badmouth God for years and years and years and decided, I'm going to use him to be a pastor of a church plant, and he's going to plant other churches, he's going to raise up leaders, and it's all going to be for my name. Do you know why he did that? Because he knew that people would see a change in me and go, something has happened to this guy. And I can't take credit for that. I can't take credit for that change. He did it. God uses broken people. Do not allow a wrong view of God to keep you from your call. Philippians says it like it says, says, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Can I tell you why that is? Because you will never feel fulfilled until you operate in your call. You will never feel fulfilled until you operate in your call. Some of you, you have a void in your life and you can't understand why it is. Man, I don't know why I wake up in the morning. I, man, I go to work. You, may, you might have a great family situation. You might have a great wife. You may have a couple of the most well-behaved children on earth. I do not, but maybe you do. And <laughs> my kids are okay, actually. They're all right. But you have everything going for you, maybe. But every time you wake up in the morning, you still feel like there's lack. There's something missing. You know why? Because you're not operating in your call. You will not be fulfilled until you're operating in your call. Luke chapter 10 says he told them, this is, this is Jesus talking again. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. We need people to break down those barriers in their lives and do something for God. You want me to put it another way? Let me put it another way. Let me give you the message translation. Stop making excuses for doing something for God. Oh, man, I, well, I'm, 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 I can't. He can't use me. I'm this. I'm this kind of person. I, he can't use me. Oh, well, I'm too cool for that. Oh, well, you, you know, Christians are just, people look at Christians weird. Men, they might already look at you weird. It's usually the weirdest person on the planet that says stuff like that, too. And the people that are like, I'm too, no, I'm too cool to be a Christian. I'm, I can't, I just would be, mm -mm, I, okay, well, you, that's, that's lame. Because you're, you're basically just admitting that you're doing what you do for, for the sake of the way that other people view you. And that's not cool. That's stupid. <laughs> that's cool, though. <laughs> Whatever you want to do. We need to break these barriers down. Wrong view of self. Wrong view of others. Wrong view of God. How are we going to break these barriers down? I'm going I'm to tell you some stuff. Aren't you so glad that I had the answer to that question today? Thank you, two of you. <laughs> That's fine. I'm going to tell you anyway because I have a microphone. Let me tell you what the first way is. First thing you need to do is this. You need to surrender your views. Yeah. You need to surrender your views. Well, church should only be done this way. Oh, well, I can't do this. Well, I can't do that. Everybody's got an opinion. Everybody's got a view. And guess what? None of them matter. None of them matter. Your opinion? Sorry, boo. Doesn't matter. Doesn't. Don't care how smart you are. Don't care how cool you think you are. Doesn't matter. When it's standing next to God, your opinions, your point of view does not matter. You, so you might as well surrender it. When you surrender your point of view... Well, look, look, let's, let, let me, I'm going to give you a, a Jesus example, okay? People like to use all these other stories, too, and talk about people like Peter. I love talking about Peter. I love talking about all the different broken people. Let me tell you about Jesus. Because Jesus, the man, was in a garden knowing that he was about to be killed. Knew it. Imagine that, by the way. Imagine that. Imagine you know exactly how you're going to die. You know the moment that the last breath is going to leave your body. 
you know exactly what every single person is going to do to you on the way. So Jesus, just like every single one of us would do, says, okay, Father, everything is possible for you. <laughs> Take this cup for me. Don't, let me don't, don't make me have to do this. But then he says something that probably none of us would say <laughs> in this moment. And he says, but you know what? It's not about what I want. Let your will be done. Let your will be done. And this moment of Jesus' life is the moment of the greatest strength that he ever showed as a man. As a man. Men. We talk to you for a minute. You think you're right all the time, right? All the time. You've got the right answer. Stuff breaks in the house, go find daddy. Right? It's true. That's not real strength. Knowing how to drive a stick shift, that's not real strength. Knowing how to change your oil, that's not real strength. We, we, we need to redefine what it is to be a man. Can I tell you what a real man can do? A real man can surrender his point of view when he realizes that it's the wrong point of view. And Jesus in this moment says, you know what? It's not about my point of view. It's about yours. It's about yours. And true strength and true holiness and true proof that you desire to answer God's call in your life is that you operate from a place of surrender to his plans. Not my will, God, but yours. You need to surrender your views. And then after you surrender your views, you need to change your perspective. Every morning that I get up, I cannot see. You want to know why? Because I can't. That's why. I don't have, an, I don't have a smart answer for you. Because I just, one day, I was 14 years old, and I couldn't see. That's how it happened. Like that. Now, I could get up, and I could operate. I could take a shower, I could get dressed, I could go get in the car, and I could drive the streets of Bakersfield. You guys probably wouldn't prefer it that way. But every morning, I make a choice to change my perspective. And once I change my perspective, I see things a lot more clearly. You still might not like my driving, but you feel a lot safer at least. We need to change our perspective, you guys. It's not enough to surrender your views. Okay, God, I get it. It's not about what I want. It's about what you want. Now you need to change your perspective. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Look at that. Healing every disease and sickness. I'm sorry, do you think you're overbooked? This dude healed every kind of sickness and disease. Imagine a time where there were no doctors. Imagine a time where they just look at a broken arm like, man, that is super broken, dude. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but you're going to die. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then this dude comes to town that's raising people from the dead. Everybody is going there, right? His, his book is full. <laughs> Right? His dance card is full. He heals every kind of sickness and disease. And then when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. This is his perspective now. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When you change your perspective in life from self to others, you'll begin to see people the way that Jesus saw people. And when you begin to see people the way that Jesus sees people, your sense of urgency will rise to reach the lost. To reach out beyond your comfort zone. And you'll begin to take action. Guys, for too long, hope has been a noun in the church. For too long, we've been talking a lot about hope. Like it was just a person, place, or thing. Hope. Hope doesn't wish it would. That's not what hope does. Hope is, hope is a verb. Hope is action. Hope, true hope. Change your perspective on what hope is. True hope takes action, produces faith, and faith can move mountains. True hope creates substance and evidence. Faith is hope and action. 
Faith answers the call. Faith doesn't wait for something else to act in its place. We need to change our perspective. Because faith says yes. And the last point I want to say is this. After you've decided that you're going to surrender your views, you're going to change your perspective, you need to say yes to the opportunities. Because they're coming. They're coming. The opportunity to say yes to something is coming. Let's go back to Matthew in the 28th chapter. Jesus said, therefore, go. Y'all can read the rest of that if you want to. But really, I put it there for those, for those words. Therefore, go. It's not enough for you. You ain't, you ain't doing nothing for God sitting in this church this morning and every Sunday and saying, okay, I'll surrender my views and I'll change my perspective and then sitting there. Hope needs to move you to action. And I would challenge you to say that you're, you've not surrendered your views and you've not changed your perspective if that's how you feel. If, if, you're, if every time an opportunity arises to say yes to God, you say no because it's more comfortable. Isaiah 6 said, Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I, send me. Send me. He said yes to the opportunity. Can I tell you something? This is the coolest part to me. In Wonder Woman, there was a lot of really cool fight scenes and stuff, and Chris Pine was really funny in it. I think that's his name. Really, really funny in it. It was a good movie. But those of you that don't know the story about Wonder Woman, she comes from this isolated place, and there's like a protective bubble. You know, it's this island out in the middle of nowhere. There's a protective bubble around this whole island. Nobody really can, you know, gets, goes in or out, and they're sitting there. And they're some of the, like, the craziest, most awesome warriors on the face of the planet. And they're all these crazy, like, Amazonian, like, tall, giant women fighters that are just totally amazing. And the world gets in to this bubble. What makes Wonder Woman so wonderful is, is this girl hears about what's going on outside of her island, outside of her bubble, and she tells the people, I got to go. I got to go. And they try to compel her to stay. Don't go. They don't deserve you. Don't go. It's not worth it. Don't go. That's not your problem. She's like, what are we training for? <laughs> what are we training for? And her response is to me the most amazing part of the movie. As they try to compel her to stay, she says, who will I be if I stay? Who will I become if I, let me ask you that question today. In the midst of everything that's happening in your life, the throes of your life, maybe your life is perfect. <coughs> Doubt it, but maybe it is. Now that you know what you know, who would you be if you stayed right where you were at? Who would you be if you chose to stay knowing that you've been compelled, invited, charged, commanded to go? Who would you be? What does that make you? What does that make us? Should we choose to stay? It's easy to get comfortable in church, to create this island of isolation where it's just us man we're like-minded we're cool we can get along that's fine that's, this is good man if people come in here that don't know it's gonna get like man, they're gonna say the wrong things and make me feel uncomfortable you know, like, i don't know i don't know if i like that but who will you be if you stay who will you be if you don't do what god has called you to do every single person under the sound of my voice in this place today you have been created for a call. You weren't just sneezed out and now you happen to breathe. You have been created for purpose. That purpose 
is greater than even you know. But what will you do with your choice? Choice is yours. Choice is yours. Will you choose to surrender your views? Will you choose to change your perspective? Will you choose to say yes to the opportunities? Will you choose to go? Will you choose to go? One of the coolest things, man, that I think Discovery does is we train up leaders. Why? So they'll go. <laughs> so they'll go. Maybe, you know what, there, there, in fact, there, there is, there's somebody here that, that doesn't, maybe you, you don't want to hear everything that I'm saying, but there's somebody here, you're a leader, and, and you've been running. You've been running. Good luck with that. Can I say something to you? If that's you and you've been running, come home, man. Come home. I don't deserve it. He can't use me. You're wrong. He's waiting for you with a ring and a robe. In fact, he'll run out and meet you halfway. I want to pray for you this morning. And the people that are bored said amen. I want to pray for you. So here's what I want to ask. I want to ask you to do me a solid and everybody just bow your heads, close your eyes, nobody looking around. 